Okay, thank you everybody for coming. Welcome to the weekly seminar series with the Center for Advanced Studies Southeast Europe. Um, today, our speaker is uh, Philip Conway. He's a um, British Academy postdoctoral fellow in the University of Durham in the Geography Department. Um, his project is called Critical Atmospheres, uh, and he works on um, the practice of criticism. Uh, that's the project. Today, he's going to uh, present to us this concept and this uh, this paper on repressive submit, uh, repressive suspicion, um, which is about conspiratorial thinking and uh, particular interviews with particular figures. So, Philip, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll just start by saying something brief about the project as a whole and where this paper kind of fits into it. Um, what I'm working on uh, in general over the three years of the postdoc that I have right now is I'm, I'm trying to write a book. Um, and the book is about critical theory in a traditional sense, but I'm also interested in you know, concrete practices of criticism, criticism in everyday life, um, the way we criticize each other, and of course also you know, political criticism. Um, the way that uh, objections get voiced in political terms more or less rationally, um, often with claims to rationality which you know, are not necessarily uh, legitimate. Um, and so the book, uh, as I'm approaching it, will be kind of structured around a comparison between uh, you know, academic, philosophical, critical theories on the one hand, uh, in, in, I, I'm starting kind of with the Frankfurt School tradition, but also you know, branching out from that, it's not being too narrow about it. So a comparison between that kind of uh, intellectual mode of critique and conspiracy theories. Um, and I think the interesting comparison there is that uh, a lot of conspiracy theories claim to be doing exactly the kinds of things that critical theories also claim to be doing, but in very different ways a lot of the time. Um, yeah, they claim to be uh, re revealing the truth to the world, you know, often in somewhat simplistic terms, but the, what, they, what they share, I think, is um, a, a desire to reveal, you know, um, why is the world the way it is, why are uh, harms and dangers and um, pathologies uh, experienced in the way that they are, you know, um, why, why are you getting screwed over, basically, is kind of the mission uh, of both sorts of uh, broadly speaking, intellectual practice. So this paper um, is something a bit more specific. I mean, the book as it is emerging is this kind of sprawling, uh, almost encyclopedic attempt to bring all these things together. But um, uh, I, I'm always on the lookout for sort of specific texts and specific moments or examples which could become, you know, a, an article or a paper or something more um, kind of granular. Um, and so, yeah, so I'll start with the paper now. Um, I'm going to have to look, look off to one side as I'm, uh, I've got it on my iPad here. Um, so if I tell you that the, uh, that the event that this paper centers around happened on the 6th of January 2021 and happened in Washington DC, you might already know uh, what I'm talking about. So uh, this story concerns the, the second most recognizable face uh, among the crowd that stormed the US Capitol building that day. Not the guy with the horns, not the QAnon shaman, as he was called, um, but uh, another guy. Um, and I can show you his picture if this is going to work. There we go. This chap. Um, this is a story of Doug Jensen, uh, a quite different character from the so called QAnon shaman, but who nevertheless became caught up in the same contorted web of conspiratorial ideation, the cultural phenomenon known as QAnon. And you can very clearly see his t-shirt there, which um, you can see a little bit more closely here. So we have a, you know, American Eagle um, within a giant Q. At the top it says, trust the plan. Uh, and at the bottom, where we go one, we go all, which are two slogans of the QAnon uh, movement. Um, now, if you've if you've seen Jensen's face before, uh, you've probably seen him uh, pursuing a black Capitol police officer up a flight of stairs. And I have that here as well. Here we go. So the Capitol police officer was called Eugene Goodman, and it was his strategic retreat uh, that led the encroaching crowd away from the Senate chamber. And this is 
worldly, as you can see from the Chiron here. Um, this is widely seen as a heroic act that uh, prevented the crowd from actually entering the Senate chamber and you know, possibly, um, well, making things go worse than they did. So the events of that day remain uh, chaotic and much contested. Um, and Jensen himself is um, due to stand trial in September and he's facing seven charges. So obviously this is um, a work in progress both on, both on my part and on the part of the US state. Um, so this paper makes no attempt to determine the facts, nor to judge guilt or innocence, nor am I even really trying to ascertain the meaning of this event in historical or political terms. Rather, in this paper, I'm focusing on Doug Jensen's story, as told by himself to two FBI agents on the 8th of January 2021. Um, so as I said, um, I'm always on the lookout for texts or examples which allow a kind of granular, granular analysis of, of the things I'm interested in. And when I came across this uh, FBI interview transcript, which was published um, earlier this year, uh, it, it just it jumped out of me as something which was incredibly um, rich, to use a kind of cliche term, um, but it really can, can contained everything that I wanted to say about the topic, you know, in one place. So it, it was really interesting to me. Um, and, and the reason why this interests me in particular, <coughs> excuse me, um, is that this, this case, this story, allows me to articulate a concept that I'm calling repressive suspicion. And I'll say a little bit more about that at the end. Okay, so I mean the short version is, is as follows. Uh, the, the QAnon cult, which again I will introduce more for anyone who isn't so familiar with it, um, the QAnon cult promises to liberate its follows, followers from a nefarious, monstrous, indeed satanic status quo. Its followers are therefore encouraged to treat with suspicion all that they may have previously taken for granted. Now via the ostentatiously esoteric Q-drops, as they are so called, practices of, practices of suspicion are actively cultivated. They're even kind of gamified um, in a very postmodern way. As, as char charismatic speculations on the meaning of these Q-drops uh, are rewarded with the warm rush of like-minded approval via you know, the veins of social media. Um, however, for all the eager engagement that these, uh, these practices evidently can induce, such practices are in the end repressive rather than liberating. Dependent as it is upon a whole cornucopia of delusions, QAnon constructs a mirage of social transformation and is premised upon the fundamentally fallacious theories of power. Um, the repressive mode of suspicion then, which is so richly embodied in this movement, um, actively subverts the emancipatory potential of radical doubt, reinforcing the status quo even while it's prophesizing revolution. So such a critical theoretical diagnosis will of course be entirely unpersuasive to any QAnon devotee. Um, indeed, critical theories themselves are already part of the conspiratorial narrative. As anyone familiar with the cultural Marxism conspiracy theory uh, will know, this is, um, this is basically the idea, it's very popular in the United States, but also in other places around the world, that, that the Frankfurt School, when they uh, fled Germany in the 1930s and went to the United States, uh, the narrative is basically that their ideas fermented everything from political correctness to environmentalism to feminism. You know, it's all like a direct descendant of this um, you know, group of generally Jewish philosophers. Um, nevertheless, um, in this in this paper, I'm not just seeking to sort of debunk uh, this 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 cult and this case, which you know is easily done. Um, I, I also want to kind of turn turn what I find in this case back on academic, academic critical theory itself and to think about, you know, the comparison works both ways, in other words. So in contrast to many contemporary critiques of critique and, um, for example, like uh, Bruno Latour has a famous paper that you may have read, uh, has critique run out of steam from 2004 and many other people have written on a similar topic saying that critique as a thought practice, as a, as a suspicious mode of thought is itself kind of uh, problematic. Um, so in contrast to these critiques of critique, uh, it's, ne it's necessary to recognize that critical theories and conspiracy theories actually involve fundamentally different ways of thinking, fundamentally different modes of suspicion. Um, 
Having said that, at the same time, we can also acknowledge that critical theories and conspiracy theories uh, are deeply connected with the levels of problem pur purpose and affective disposition. I think the way that it feels to be uh, a critic and the way that it feels to be a conspiracy theorist is kind of similar. It's all about being oppositional. It's all about not accepting the standard narrative, not accepting the status quo um, and so on. And furthermore, if the likes of QAnon promote repressive modes of suspicion, it does not follow the critical theories, therefore promote emancipatory modes. You know, that's still very much up in the air. Um, indeed, this comparison may highlight some fundamental problems for any intellectually driven would-be emancipatory discourse. Uh, and I'll say more about that at the end as well. So, like all the best propaganda, QAnon is nourished by grains of truth. Um, the elitism of the intellectual classes uh, may indeed be one of those grains. Um, one thing about QAnon, as we will see in a moment, it's, it's radically participatory, even if it's weirdly directed towards clearly anti-democratic political goals. Um, it, the, the claims of such conspiracy thinking to be critical thinking is, is you know, I, I think easily demonstrated as fallacious. Nevertheless, we can turn this around and prompt difficult questions for the very intellectual classes, you and me, all of us here together, who um, all too often self-conscious, unself-consciously presume our practices of, of suspicious thinking to be above suspicion. So, yeah, uh, before I get into the main part, um, you know, a very quick history of QAnon. So QAnon is a, a distinctly modern phenomenon in two senses. Uh, first, it relies upon a very sort of classic, if extremely simplified, image of the modern subject. The, the, the modern subject is a subject of knowledge, who um, by, ref, by refusing uh, everything one cannot verify with one's own senses, um, and then only trusting what one believes one can verify with own, one's own senses, thereby you arrive at something like you know, truth, some certainty. Um, and so there is a, a very common uh, uh, refrain, very common catchphrase even in conspiracist communities, which is do your own research. So don't trust what the media tell you, get online. Uh, you, these days, you know, it's all online. Um, in years gone by, you know, there would be more uh, uh, analog ways of showing this information. But today you get online, you search um, for these things and you, 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 you trust, um, you trust the web pages more than you do um, you know, the, uh, the CNN or whoever. Um, second, um, QAnon is a distinctly modern phenomenon in, in the sense of contemporary, you know. Um, while it has extremely long roots, um, its particular way of working uh, it is only possible in the age of social media. Um, it, it's, a, it's a distinctly, um, yeah, social media age phenomenon. Um, yeah, so I've, I've already said about where this um, uh, uh, text comes from. I would just say before I go any further that um, the story that I'm telling and the story that, you know, this guy Doug Jensen is telling of himself does contain mentions of both child sexual abuse and suicide. So I just want to mention that I don't dwell on these for very long, but, you know, I want to raise that before continuing. Um, Okay, so yeah, I mean, to, to talk about QAnon in general, it's necessary to deal with some somewhat disturbing subject matter. So, um, beginning in October 2017, uh, QAnon derives from a series of cryptic messages which are posted to the image boards 4chan and 8chan, and, a, and later a number of derivative uh, sites. Uh, and 4chan and 8chan, you may you may have heard of these. They are two uh, notorious, anonymous, largely on unmoderated online forums that are best known for their fermentation of um, uh, racist and misogynistic trolling culture, and more recently for hosting the manifestos of several uh, white supremacist mass shooters uh, in the United States, also in New Zealand uh, and other places as well. Um, so. This, this Q phenomenon, it, it actually, um, while it is, you know, presents itself as being completely unprecedented in you, it actually follows in a kind of tradition on these message boards. 
because um, you know a large part of the the discourse is on there is people just making stuff up and seeing how many people they can get to take them seriously and there is a tradition of people posing as government insiders releasing secret information um, but you know this is the first um, this is the first uh, uh, this is the first example of that genre um, which you know broke the bounds of of these kind of fringe message boards, influential but still fringe message boards, and actually entered the, you know, the broader ecosystem. Um, so it, QAnon kind of operates as a kind of syncretic synthesis of almost every conspiracy theory around. It's extremely accommodating in terms of the, the discourses it can combine, but at the core is, is a, simple, a simple narrative which is that the world is run by a cabal of satanic paedophiles, which the then president, uh, Donald J. Trump, is secretly working to overthrow. And this cabal is led by the likes of Hillary Clinton and George Soros, and these people are basically evil incarnate. You know, they are, they are essentially the devil. Um, and the, the essential accusation of what this cabal does and why it is so terrible is that they capture and torture, rape and murder children en masse, in order to, uh, in order that the elites may gorge themselves on adrenalized blood. So uh, immediately, anyone familiar with the history of conspiracy theories will see this is drawing upon classic anti-Semitic uh, narratives, particularly blood libel and so on. Uh, but, you know, giving it a sort of, again, a, a contemporary and um, somewhat deniable spin. <clears throat> so against this, uh, Trump is striking back through uh, a, number, a whole range of obscure uh, legal, quasi-legal, para, paramilitary manoeuvres behind the scenes. And of course, this is all going back to when Trump was president, although as I will mention a little bit, you know, this is still ongoing, people still sort of believe in this. It's still, it's still very much part of the conspiracy culture of the American right. Um, and in the background to this, while Trump is sort of in the foreground as the, the, the leader, um, the, the great man, the you know, quasi-fascist, uh, big guy. Uh, in the background, there is this mysterious figure of Q, who is the person or possibly team of people posting these cryptic messages to this image board and thereby seeding, um, seeding the truth, what is going on behind the curtain, to, uh, to, to those who are following, to, to the followers uh, who are the anons, anonymous users following Q, hence QAnon. Um, so Q is Trump's messenger and Trump is the world's salvation. Anons are quote unquote digital soldiers who bake the esoteric crumbs deposited by Q via kind of homespun hermeneutics. Um, in other words, these, these, these missives are not self-interpreting. There is a whole class of, um, of influencers. It was on YouTube for a lot for a long time. A lot of those people kicked off in the end. Um, but influencers who were able to latch on and essentially interpret and, and create the whole kind of mythology of Q from these, from these sort of, you know, let's say very esoteric and uh, cryptic messages. Um, uh, yes, and uh, so uh, after the um, election of Joe Biden uh, 18 months or so ago, uh, Q stopped posting, but then uh, just a couple of days after the Roe versus Wade decision, um, effectively, you know, overturning that legal precedent, uh, Q started posting again. Um, the question of who Q is has obviously been a, a big thing over the past several years. Um, it's still uncertain who started this, but in terms of who holds the account now and who has held it for the last couple of years, um, or the, at least the last uh, three or four years, it's pretty clear that it is the uh, the owners of 4chan and 8chan, uh, Ron Watkins and his father Jim. And there is a there's a Netflix documentary uh, Q into the storm which follows these guys. And if you want to know like their narrative, it's, it's a very good documentary. Um, so it's pretty clear like who is doing this and probably why. Um, Ron Watkins is, is running for, these two, they are Americans, but uh, living in Thailand, and um, they're basically pornographers who um, set up a number of websites, including uh, one of the Chans. Um, 
and uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Ron Watkins is running for office in the United States. They're all um, they're all trolls. You know, they like to troll people, um, mess people up their own way. There's clear that ideological and personal and financial reasons for kind of getting on board with this, but. In a way, it doesn't really matter who Q is. It doesn't really matter the reason why they're doing this. The QAnon exists for the most part because there is a need for it to exist. Um, in other words, you know, if it wasn't this, it would have been something else. Um, and this can be understood, I think, quite vividly in the case of Doug Jensen. So Jensen's interview was undertaken voluntarily and without legal representation after he, he handed himself in to the police. Um, the text reads almost like a stage play. It's quite a remarkable thing to read, although it's not to say it reads like a work of fiction. On the contrary, while Jensen is clearly attempting to justify his actions, um, and he is well aware of the trouble that he is in, his self-narration is almost painfully earnest. It's difficult not to feel a kind of pathos arising from how this self-proclaimed digital soldier, in his very own war against the satanic deep state, seems to desire nothing more than the acknowledgement and respect of the FBI agents who are, with an understated and perhaps even genuine compassion, actually coaxing him into incriminating himself. So there are, there are layers to this. Um, it's difficult to reconstruct this uh, interview, which runs to 146 pages and I think was uh, recorded over about three hours. Um, the, the agents direct him, obviously, to certain questions that they are interested in. For example, did he see himself as a leader? No. Um, did he see anybody with weapons? Yes. Um, however, the conversation also meanders and proceeds at Jensen's own pace. And it's kind of punctuated with moments where almost out of nowhere, he divulges, um, he divulges traumas from his past, basically. Things that he seems to have wanted to get off his chest. I mean, it's almost like, it's almost like a kind of impromptu therapy session in a situation where uh, there is no possibility of therapy. But, you know, that's the way it kind of works out. So they start off by talking about his background and how he's a construction worker and they kind of, there's a kind of bonding, you know, a conversational bonding over the fact that he's been a construction worker for 20 years and that there's a sort of earthy masculinity that they try to, you know, build a shared feeling around. Um, he talks about you know, the work he does on site and how he's kind of the guy who does all, does all the work. He can do everything, but he's not the foreman. You know, he's not the guy in charge. Um, and you know, it kind of turns out that Jensen is, is, is he's the kind of uh, American that, you know, uh, we, anyone who pays attention to American politics, has heard a great deal about since 2016. You know, he's a former Obama voter, a lifelong Democrat who flipped for Trump. Um, so he says, so I voted for Trump both, uh, yeah, sorry, let's try that again. So I voted both terms for Obama and during the presidency, I thought he was the great president, the health thing. The health thing didn't ben benefit me and my family because I had union health insurance. So I got no benefits from it, but I was happy that all those people got insurance, you know? And so I was happy for, happy with him. And then I was going to vote for Hillary because I've been a Democrat my whole life. And then the WikiLeaks thing happened and I had to start questioning where I was getting in my info from. And that's when I realized, you know, holy cow, I can't vote for this woman. And then it became like, I started telling everybody I know back, back then about WikiLeaks and everything. Uh, and then that died off when Trump won. And then I didn't really have anything. I was happy Trump won, you know? And then all of a sudden, Q drop started. So I think that's like a very engaging sort of way in, um, in that there was clearly a kind of compulsion behind his engagement with this subject matter. Um, and the, the WikiLeaks thing he mentioned is the release of uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, or the, the emails of John Podesta in relation to who was the chair of Hillary, Clinton, Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. I won't go into sort of all the tangled web of it. You know, it's 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 all very familiar stuff. Um, he, uh, Jensen goes on to talk about um, the Clintons uh, goings on in Haiti. Um, uh, which is a real scandal involving the Clinton Foundation and the misappropriation of aid money. Um, you know, Jeffrey Epstein is also mentioned, Hunter Biden's laptop, you know, all the cliches of the kind of Trumpist era suspicion are, are there, including the so-called Pizzagate conspiracy, which is a kind of forerunner of QAnon. Um, 
Uh, he also uh, repeats another tr another plank of the QAnon narrative that there are a mass of military tribunals going on behind closed doors. Um, so this is a, this is a quote: John McCain was executed, I think, and he was tied into ISIS somehow, um, which I, is difficult to really interpret. But it's the kind of you know paranoid uh, reasoning which is extremely common in this sphere. Um, again, on a, a sort of geopolitical topics, he says. We were supposed to be dead by now, and if Hillary would have won, we were going to be attacked by North Korea or Iran. We were going to go to war, and we would most likely, half of us wouldn't be here right now if Trump wouldn't have won that election, is what I got from it. So, uh, you know, the, the, the stakes of this are clearly existential. That's the, that's the level all this is ramped up to kind of affectively. You know, it's, it's life, life or death, while at the same time being completely quotidian, completely ordinary. And it's really the, the ability to combine those things, which is a kind of a fascinating uh, aspect of this, I think. Um, so although Jensen deleted his uh, Facebook and Twitter accounts uh, after leaving Washington, D.C. Uh, on the 6th, uh, already aware that he was probably in trouble, um, a YouTube account still exists with his username. And this has videos uh, linked to it uh, as playlists, um, a, a video claiming that moon landing was a hoax. Uh, and two videos um, explore, ex exploring chemtrails, you know, the idea that the vapor trails left behind uh, high altitude uh, aeroplanes are part of some sort of uh, climate engineering or mind control program by the government. So, uh, and then Jensen also mentions towards the end of the interview, he's also into like UFO trutherism. So he's clearly someone who is susceptible to all this kind of thinking um, uh, previously. Um, so I'll skip ahead a little bit, as I'm already getting on with a little bit of time. Um, so one of the interesting and sympathetic aspects of this is that, um, I mean, like I said before, all good propaganda contains a grain of truth. Um, and so, for example, there's another quotation I'll read here. And it's the, you know, so I'm, I'm a full believer that somebody's out there trying to give the real information to the public, basically, you know. And so I used to believe the news and believe everything it said, you know. I heard it on TV, it's true, you know, over the last four years, I've learned that the corporations, there's only like five different, like Disney owns ABC. There's only like five or six different corporations or people that own pretty much all of TV and news and all that. And so we're getting, we're obviously getting one-sided news. And maybe it's uh, and it's called coming from China. Maybe maybe China owns Disney. Um, so it's you know it's kind of a mishmash of different ideas. Some of them obviously with a grain of truth, but all of them directed towards politi particular political narratives. Um, you know, essentially based in xenophobia, essentially based in complete mistrust of the mainstream and complete credulity towards this one particular narrative, which claims to be going against the mainstream. So he goes on, he talks about brainwashing. Um, but what really comes across is the, the emotional benefit that he is deriving from his association with Trump uh, uh, as this kind of great leader. Um, the, emotional, the emotional investment in Trump is very clear. Um, he's not only a figure of hope, he's also a figure of pride. Um, Yes, and he says, you know, he's so frustrated whenever Trump is criticized, where everything's always negative about him, because it seems to, you know, that negativity reflects back on him, because he has found this attachment of something which for him is very positive. Any criticism, criticism of the leader is experienced in this kind of very immediate and bodily sense. Um, and he, he goes on to say that, yeah, this is why he's done nothing but his own research for two, two years straight, like he... He gets up, he works eight hours a day, he comes home, and then he's just there on his phone all, all day, every day on his phone, reading, 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 everything to do with QAnon, which is, of course, an inexhaustible you know, fire hose of, uh, of, of, of this discourse. Um, but as, as I mentioned before, there are moments where this kind of narrative uh, is sort of interrupted by moments of like confession, almost like therapeutic uh, eruption. Um, so he's asked about a number of things and when he's talking about his work, his life as a construction worker, he mentions that when he was 25 and he had this, he's now in his early forties, um, he, he injured his back. And so now he takes muscle relaxers, anti-inflammatories, 
uh, and his wife has to kind of take care of that. She's a nurse. Um, and then from from this conversation, talking about you know, his his back and these these problems with pain he has, almost mid sentence, like without skipping a beat, he then moves straight into how um, his brother in law committed suicide by uh, by firearm. Um, and so he gets this call, he goes over to the house, um, and basically the, the police, because it was a suicide, the police won't clean up. They just, they just record what's going on and they leave. And it's up to you, you can pay like X thousands of dollars to get a private company to clean up for you. And they didn't have this, so this guy, Doug Jensen, he had to clear up his own uh, you know, brother-in-law's blood and skull and all terrible things. And he says, so he's describing what he did. He cleaned up, he um, repainted the walls, retextured the ceiling. And he says, and I couldn't sleep very good after that. Um, to which the agent, the, the FBI agents kind of react as you would have to, you know, sympathetically. So after that, he was put on antidepressants. Um, but there is clearly something in QAnon which helps him. Um, there's clearly something he is getting out of it that allows him to escape this, escape this pain. Um, and one thing he does very often is compares, um, he compares what's going on to a movie. He says it's like watching a movie. Uh, and I'll quote again. Uh, and I watched real life play out. It was almost like I was getting information from the future almost, you know. And just so I think what really gripped me from the beginning was the child trafficking and all that with the Hillary Clinton thing. That's what hooked me right off the bat. And so again, like almost mid sentence, he then adds, uh, I was molested when I was seven until I was 14. Um, apparently the, the molester was the director of a youth mentoring organization in Iowa. Um, and the details are sketchy, but it's clear that no one was, you know, prosecuted or brought to justice for this and that he was not the only survivor. Um, he adds that he's been, you know, by the time he was seven years old. He'd already been to 20 or more foster homes. I mean, that seems like a lot, but you know, I'm going along with his own story, you know, not having any better information. And so when Q comes along, he says, and I quote, it was like my rise up to fight it in a way, I guess. So again, we're coming to the repressive dimension of this. Clearly there is an aspect of this. He, he's into a lot of like, you know, weird and, um, unhelpful stuff but there is an aspect of this where he clearly wants justice he clearly wants to do good but because he's following this narrative which is created inherently to manipulate him into you know performing political acts in service of an anti-democratic regime uh, the result of this is inherently repressive it's taking his suspicion and putting it to repressive ends so, I mean, uh, he goes on, he became addicted to crystal meth as a child and smoked it with, a, with the mother of a friend, uh, who, a friend whose father also committed suicide. And this is, um, and this is in a nutshell, is his explanation. And of course, throughout all this, he's, he's, he's trying to justify himself and to, you know, present, present his reasons for doing what he did. Uh, and this is why he followed that, well, we can still see on the screen now, this is why he was there that day, he says. That's why he followed the police officer up the stairs. Uh, he says, I'm kind of a big guy and I'm intimidating, but really I'm a nice guy. I really am, you know. I'm not racist. I help people, you know. And I think that comes from what happened to me. I've always tried to fix everyone else's problem. Um, and his, his essential justification for being there that day is that he wanted Q to get the credit. He wanted Q to be front and centre. Um, and this is part of his, he says, uh, my job as a digital soldier is to be the news to try to share that stuff on my Facebook and so on. He says, well, I have like, I have 500 followers on Facebook. So, you know, that's, if I can just get this message out to 500 people, like that's his, he feels like he's done something. He feels like he's acted and he's, he played his part in, in this, in this movement. Um, and it's clear, clear also that there is a compensatory uh, attachment here. He says, the thing, the thing about Q is Q is so slick. Um, you know, impervious, brilliant, unbreakable, these are my words. Um, Q is the shadowy mastermind to Trump's shining celebrity. Okay, so I'll move on again a little bit, so I don't run on too long. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, th there's a lot of other stuff which comes out. Uh, Jensen, like a great many American white men, is very, very keen to say that he's not racist, although, you know, he's, um, he, re he repeats with, with some questioning the idea which has been produced, uh, reproduced a lot on the American right, that uh, Michelle Obama was secretly a man, um, which is obviously just, you know, racist, misogynistic um, nonsense. Um, but he, he does he does kind of question that. He says, well, I've heard that. I'm not so sure about that. But so many people are saying it. He says, you know, so many people are saying these things. Like, it's difficult for me not to believe it. Like, some of it has to be true, surely, doesn't it? Like, you know, there's always some truth in it. Um, he also talks about uh, various conspiracies around JFK. Um, uh, he's also... Um, Again, following the conventional narrative, he's um, he's afraid of an Antifa. He's afraid of anti-fascists. He thinks that he's going to be followed home, and his family are going to be threatened by Antifa because of you know because he's been in the news. Um, and this, I think, is maybe part of why he's you know coming to the police voluntarily. You know, he he's kind of seeking their protection, which is again extremely ironic, because and this is a great irony running all the way through this interview is that. On the one hand, the deep state is this terrible satanic enemy out to get all of us. And yet when he's faced with two actual real FBI agents who are obviously trying to entrap him in some way, uh, they're certainly trying to get him to get him to say whatever he knows, faced with uh, the actual state, which is actually you know a threat to him, he's completely disarmed um, because he, he has none of the conceptual resources. He has none of the sort of um, inherited reasons for suspicion that would lead him to actually question the actual state that's actually in front of him. So in, in one way, so he, he has this extreme suspicion, um, which because it doesn't translate into the real world, uh, actually leaves him vulnerable. Um, and it's, yeah, so there's this odd contradiction running throughout. Um, and ultimately, uh, obviously, he, this is this interview is going on after the inauguration of Joe Biden, and so uh, you know, everything that Q has been saying has been disconfirmed and disconfirmed again. But like like every abusive relationship, uh, this leads him to question himself. He doesn't question the leaders; he questions his own um, interpretations. Um, so he says, um, "But it kind of came and went, and then I was wrong again, wrong again. I'm always wrong again." Was I duped by Antifa? Did I go in with Antifa? Am I an idiot? And he's like, you know, by the end, he's really kind of almost begging the FBI agents to, to tell him, to, you know, he's saying like, you guys, you, you're part of the state. Do you not know? Have you not, have you not looked into this? Um, can you tell me? Can you tell me? Am I, am I crazy? Am I not? You know, is this real? And of course, all they, all they say is, well, that, well, that's kind of interesting. I haven't heard of that. You know, maybe I can pass that information on because they're, they're maintaining the pretense in order to get him to talk. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so there's one last quotation on this point. And I'm like, you guys got the power, you know, you guys are the cops. Uh, you guys are the cops, do it. You know, like, and it just seems to me like our FBI is corrupt, that our CIA is corrupt. And it's like, and I know you guys are FBI and, FBI, and I'm not saying you guys are corrupt, right? I just, it's hard to trust anything anymore. It really is. Um, and this is kind of the, the, so this is repressive suspicion, right? Um, uh, it's suspicion directed at the wrong things. It's also suspicion which is excessive. Um, it's suspicion which presupposes a logic of intentionality. Uh, i.e. there are, you know, bad people do bad things. If bad things are happening, you need to find the bad people. Um, and ultimately, it's a, it's a kind of suspicion which actually doesn't protect, it doesn't, um, it doesn't provide the resources to navigate a complicated and dangerous world. It actually, in many ways, does the opposite. Because it's all about manipulation and it's all about um, channeling, channeling suspicion, channeling pain and and also resentment and anger and hatred um, and sort of thwarted supremacy um, channeling all these things in the direction of a, a, a political project um, in this case you know the the, the individuality of, of Donald Trump 
uh, and the forces around him. You know, over the coming years, we will see in the US context what this becomes, whether Trump was still uncertain as whether he will be prosecuted or maybe he'll be the next president again. You know, we, it's all up in the air. So despite claiming, and I quote, that I'm all about revolution, basically, uh, it's clear that Doug Jensen is not. He is someone who um, desires justice in a very most conventional way and cannot possibly get it from the places he's looking for it. Okay, so I will now get to my conclusion. Um, so conspiracism in general, i.e. conspiratorial thinking kind of on a on the level of a theory of everything. Um, conspiracism operationalizes the logic of the bad apple. You know, um, if there is something rotten in the world, um, the problem is not with the world itself. Something has gotten into the world from the outside and you need to root that out and remove it and then everything will go back to the way things should be, which is basically how they are now, only better. Um, this, this way of thinking is completely different to, a, a, to put it simply, a structural mode of analysis, right? So uh, any, the classic critical theory is based upon a structural mode of analysis where you take uh, society or you take capitalism to be a totality. Each part of that totality is interrelated, interdependent, uh, and in order to change anything significant within that totality, you kind of have to change everything. All the parts have to change uh, in order for anything to change. And that's something completely different to this way of thinking. Although it presents itself as being revolutionary, it presents itself as being emancipatory. Uh, it isn't and can't be because it is ultimately directed towards the view that the world is essentially okay the way that it is, or at least it was okay in the past and something has perverted it. And the, the goal is, is, is not really to change the world, but it's to, you know, to weed out the elements that are making it impure. And of course, you know, the, the relationship to anti-Semitism historically and contemporarily is, 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 is obvious. Um, and well, I, yeah, I mean, I won't say too much, but I, I, I draw this phrase repressive suspicion sort of analogously from Herbert Marcuse's notion of repressive tolerance. Um, so this is an essay he wrote in the late 1960s, basically arguing that uh, there is, uh, you know, to, it's a classic argument, you can't tolerate intolerance, but specifically he takes that a step further and says, we have to sort of politically organize around, um, uh, uh, around being against those, um, those forces which, uh, you know, uh, manipulate and make use of uh, liberal tolerance and thereby subvert it. Um, so in this paper, I have tried to walk a line between empathy and explanation. I would just like, I would kind of add finally that I'm not saying that this particular individual is representative of, um, of the people who stormed the American Capitol on that day. He's not representative of QAnon followers or Trump supporters or of conspiracists, you know, more widely, but, um, I think it is interesting to take, um, to look at someone who, because of their life story, is on some level sympathetic. I think it's it's easy to find moments of sympathy with him. He's, he's clearly someone who is vulnerable and who has been placed in a, um, a vulnerable position by the, uh, you know, by the uh, kind of apparatus of manipulation that, um, American Republican right-wing politics has created. Um, and then finally, uh, the final point is that, uh, well, the third final point uh, is that uh, I think there is also a way of turning this whole analysis back on critical theory in a slightly different way. Because one thing that really jumps out at me and one thing I think is very interesting about QAnon is how radically participatory it is. Anyone can get involved with it, with no training, no previous education really, all you need is the excitement, um, all you need is the sort of feeling that you are drawn in and that you are part of something. And that reflects in many ways badly back on critical theories, which are a kind of elitist project. Certainly if you read, you know, Adorno and Horkheimer and all these people, 
Yeah, there is a there is a dimension to it which is kind of sneering and which is looking down their nose at um, anyone who doesn't understand atonal music or hasn't read Hegel. Um, and so, yeah, that is then the essential problematic that I'm trying to get to with this project more broadly, which is that the what conspiracy theories and QAnon in particular offer is a kind of anti-intellectual intellectualism, which um, parallels, but is also radically different from the kind of intellectualism we as academics practice. But I think it's, uh, yeah, it's necessary to, with these things to go beyond debunking and to actually see what these uh, different practices have in common and how that actually might reflect back poorly on the way that we go about things. And I will stop there. Thanks so much, Philip. That was really, really interesting. And really interesting to see you going into such depth about conspiratorial thinking, but with some kind of respect instead of labeling it, you know, very quickly labeling it as something less than rationality or so on and so on, but really going into it. I see we have questions. I think immediately I saw some hands, but now they look like they've disappeared. Uh, if anyone has any questions, maybe you can click the little raise hand. Sorry, Philip, I will just ask you if you could please stop sharing the screen so that oh, yeah. we all can see. There we go. Ah, oh, yes. Thanks. Okay. I think that uh, Tom has a question in the chat. I don't know if he is, if he can go. I think it was when you mentioned that the, the, uh, the uh, owners, founders of 4chan or uh, these people who you were saying it's very likely um, have the Q account, are running the Q account. When you said that they're in Thailand, Tom mm. typed this. Um, if there's any mention of Q-like movements in Asia. Um, I don't know about that specifically. I, I'm, I'm now in the process, well, this is a very American-centric paper. Um, I'm also interested in, you know, yeah broadening that out in terms of Q in specifically I mean believe it or not there are you know there are groups uh, not just in the United States but around the world who um, are into this there is there are QAnon groups in Germany and in the UK and um, other places as well it's not it's not a simply US uh, based phenomenon again again because it is so syncretic and um, uh, flexible um, I mean, given the recent um, assassination of the former uh, Japanese prime minister, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens with um, with that. Uh, it's still, you know, we're short on details, but it seems to have been motivated at least in part by his association with um, uh, the Moonies, who are themselves uh, an organization that cross over between the United States and, and South Korea, you know, this... Uh, kind of esoteric Christianity uh, mixed often with the li literal worship of firearms. Um, it's an extraordinarily odd thing to, to experience from the outside. Um, so I, I mean, about that specifically, I can't really give any good references or whatever, but I am very much interested in the internationalism of, of this phenomenon. Um, and certainly, uh, yeah, I mean, you can find conspiratorial thinking wherever you want to go. Um, I don't know, the specific dynamics of Q are to some extent peculiar, peculiarly American, but I would also not be surprised if this also has residents in other, in other contexts. There must be some connection to this very similar case in the UK that happened recently where one person, an aide, or perhaps even a police officer alleged that they had knowledge of a uh, paedophile ring in the Houses of Parliament. And, it was, and there was a big media storm and it turned out to be one person yeah, making those allegations on the basis of nothing. Yeah, I remember, okay, I can't, I can't remember the names or whatever. Oh, um... Things keep popping up on my screen. I'm distracted. Okay, things. Yeah, um, yeah. I remember. I remember this case. There, there is something about child sexual abuse which 
uh, I think, yeah, perhaps needs to be understood a little more deeply than I have gone into it here. Um, because of course, like, like I said, these things have grains of truth. These things exist, but um, there is an element of, of denial. Um, it's all very, um, easy, it's all very interpretable in terms of psychoanalysis. And of course, using the word repression, Mark User in his essay doesn't really go into the Freudian di dimensions of this. Um, but of course, there is a, a psychoanalytically repressive dimension to this in as much as we know that most sexual abuse of all kinds happens either in the home or among people that, you know, that the victim knows the perpetrator. Um, and so that is a, a truth that is repressed by the narrative that this is some globe spanning systemic organization, you know, some, some evil that can be rooted out. Um, because if you, if you round up all the bad people and execute them as the QAnon, uh, story says is happening, then the problem's solved, right? But if it's if it's something more deeply rooted in patriarchy and in um, the structure of the family and in um, all these other things, uh, without being too fatalistic, it's much more difficult to resolve. But also, it requires very different kinds of solutions. Solutions addressed towards again <laughs> towards the totality, towards everything. Um, and that the world in which that was no longer a problem would not look like the world we're in now. Um, a lot of stuff, a lot more stuff would have to change. And so, yeah, I mean, child sexual abuse is obviously something that is, uh, again, uh, in the 1980s, there was a so-called satanic panic. Like there, there are many different examples you can give of this. I, I think one reason why this is such a central facet of this kind of thought is that, you know, it's just the worst thing that anyone can do, right? You know abusing a child in that way is just the worst thing anyone can think of. And so uh, it is the greatest evil and therefore the greatest enemy. And if you really want to demonize your enemies, you associate them with that. I mean, that's, that's kind of obvious. Um, in terms of, uh, and again, I mean, I want to tread very carefully because I just don't know that much about this sort of stuff, but there is also uh, a great problem with repressed memories um of people remembering things people who have been traumatized remembering things that haven't actually happened and that the satanic panic was a famous example of this um with uh, a group of school children who were kind of like coerced into confessing that they had been abused when they hadn't like the the very act of getting them to talk about this stuff was itself a kind of abusive relationship and and yeah, it all came from like what one person claiming a, a school um, or a nursery teacher, I think, had been abusing children. And then they basically coerced the children into remembering things that hadn't happened. Um, and, and it all kind of carried on from that. But um, yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's all I can really think to say on that point. Marco Luca, you have a hand raised. Thanks. Thank you, Philip, for a great talk. Uh, I have like a million questions and things which I could sort of uh, raise. We're also doing a project called Cultures of Rejection, which sort of touches upon these themes. We did a lot of research on, on conspiracy theory, particularly as it relates to sort of COVID, anti-COVID uh, uh, protests and movements in Croatia and in other countries in Europe. And it's also interesting what you're saying about sort of QAnon, it's very sort of adaptable to, to sort of local contexts and it's very much sort of alive and kicking in Croatia as well in Telegram channels and, and so forth. So it's, but it's also, there's many questions, but maybe it's sort of two which, which I would like to sort of more of sort of to pick your brain about what you think about these things. First of all, uh, there is this connection between the sort of extreme, what, what you, the concept of maybe your concept of repressive suspicion and, uh, but in general, sort of these, these types of excessive hyper skepticism of everything. And it's connected to at the same time towards sort of very excessive trust in a very specific set of sources. So I was found that relationship quite puzzling so i just want to sort of uh, see what, what you think about it or if you can sort of 
say something more about it maybe. Okay. And the other thing is, the second question would be, there is a this, at the same time, and especially when it comes to sort of recent murders in Uvalde, I think, and recent sort of set of, of American murders, you, in these manifestos, you, you also see this sort of uh, something which we could call kind of right-wing accelerationist narrative, which is distinct, but which is the sort of appears to me distinct from QAnon in a sense of being pessimistic as opposed to QAnon being essentially optimistic in the sense that once we get rid of this pedophiles and uh, whatever rings of powerful people, then the world, we will, we are going to liberate the world. I mean, QAnon has this idea of uh, we're poor participating in this revolution, which will end up with some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of liberation of the world. And at the same time, there appears to be sort of similar offshoot of this movement, which is totally pessimistic and just wants to sort of, does not believe that there is any sort of world behind everything. So I was just thinking if there, if, do you think maybe these things are sort of connected or what is the relation between them and stuff like that? Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, yes, thank you very much for the questions. Um, so yes, yeah, exactly, there's this, um, in, in a way, if, if you claim to be totally suspicious of all mainstream narratives, you, you almost have to be completely credulous towards something else, otherwise you just end up, you know, having no beliefs whatsoever, right? Um, the one thing kind of relates to the other. Um, so yeah, I am I am very interested in this in terms of the the, the broader project, um, because as I said right at the beginning, like there is something quintessentially modern about this this ideal this ideal of the knowing subject as someone who doubts everything. I mean, this is like maybe like kind of grade school, um, uh, slightly juvenile a juvenile version of it, but this is basically the way we are we are taught to think, you know. Don't don't take tradition. Don't take inherited knowledge for granted. Um, question everything. And indeed, you know, scholars say this all the time, whether they are you know self-identified critical scholars or not. You know, we we quite try to question everything. We try to find evidence for things. Um, and I think again, trying to maybe be maybe turn this back on us and not just you know fixate on debunking that there is a problem. Um, with our own narratives of how um, how we think of, of what you know good modes of thought are, we, we can easily recognise this kind of QAnon type stuff as being, uh, <laughs> at the very least, uh, a deeply unhelpful way of thinking. But it doesn't necessarily then follow that we know <laughs> the right ways of thinking. Um, you know, to, to take one of the most kind of reproduced quotations on this topic, you know, Karl Marx calls for a ruthless criticism of everything existing, and that is the you know, a quintessentially radical statement that many, many people have drawn um, you know, drawn inspiration from over the years and continue to do so, and yet uh, you know, a radical criticism of everything existing, what, what exactly does that mean? Okay, there is, you know, in, in if we interpret that, you know, in a more adequate way, we can understand that criticism is not just negation, it's not just doubt, it's a, a more sort of, it has an internal rationalism to it. And yet that's very often lost. And, and, and um, I also mentioned these kind of, there, is a, there are many literatures across a variety of disciplines, including international politics right now on the critique of critique and post critique, some people call it. And they are drawing attention to these same issues, um, but they are doing so in a way that I think conflates conspiratorial suspicion and, and critical suspicion. So what I'm atten essentially attempting to do is to recognize those problems that these you know, authors, Latour and whoever else uh, draw attention to, but then do so in a more precise and I think uh, less caricatured way. Um, so on the subject then of the kind of accelerationist right. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing that I am very interested in, in the American right, um, uh, and in the in the sort of reformulation that it is currently undergoing, you know, when maybe Trump is not the vehicle for the American right anymore, or maybe he is, who knows? But in any case, there is no going back. There's no going back to pre-2016. Uh, the, the Republican Party is now, to a very significant extent, the party of, of Trumpist 
uh, thinkers, uh, Trumpist, you know, politics. Um, and well, yeah, so the connection between QAnon and the accelerationist kind of borderline terrorist, uh, right? Well, not borderline, actually terrorist, right? Um, is that, um, well, it's, it's the connection, they had, there is a continuous connection between sort of the mainstream Republican Party and all these more fringe groups, which is not to say there's a direct connection, but if you trace three or four different people, you end up, you end up, you know, tracing a, a line. Um, and well, yeah, QAnon in particular has been very influential and very clearly influential um, in terms of informing the anti-trans kind of politics at the moment. Um, the, the, the the coming backlash against uh, gay rights, civil rights, um, the the notion of um, groomers, basically saying that all liberal school teachers essentially are grooming children. The deliberate watering down of that term, you know, grooming meaning preparing for sexual abuse, and then taking that, then you know, watering that down to the point where it means grooming means like telling telling a child anything its parents don't want it to hear. That that is grooming, um, grooming into grooming into the the language of equality, grooming into believing that you know you should be kind to others. <laughs> this is all the same. So um, what what QAnon has done and has, it's been a resource for the mainstreaming of you know extremely reactionary ideas um, and the accelerationist right, the terrorist right. They're all drawing from the same soup. Like they draw out different bits, they draw out different parts. Um, but it's all part of the same sort of, you know, uh, pool of resources. And, and of course, this is also transnational, international, because, um, uh, you know, um, these American manifestos draw from uh, European uh, newspaper columnists and uh, Anders Breivik um, was drawing from American, uh, you know, it's, it's all part of the same, same networks. And, of course, you can't individuate and say these are all, or you can't um, homogenize and say these are all exactly the same thing, because they're not. They don't actually have the same objectives. You know, the majority of QAnon followers um, have never been on and probably never heard of 4chan or 8chan. Um, most QAnon followers, including this guy Doug Jensen, he didn't go to 4chan or 8chan. He got his Q drops from aggregator sites. So there are a number of aggregator sites which streamline that, and yet wherever a new Q post appears you immediately get an alert on your phone or whatever. You, it's extremely um, user-friendly. It's an extremely user-friendly mode of delivery. Um, and so, I mean, because 4chan, 8chan are really just the toilet of the internet. It's full of not just pornography, but child pornography, you know, images of dead bodies and all sorts of just really horrible things that the vast majority of people don't want to see, you know, um, particularly like your, your average evangelical Christian um, who gets into this stuff? They don't want to see that that stuff. They don't even want to know that it exists, but um, they do like the message, and they do like the message that this particular, uh, you know, this particular environment has has generated. So, yeah, it's it's this it's exactly this kind of flow back and forward, backwards and forwards of all these um, symbolic symbolic resources, I guess, which. Um, it's, it's always difficult to say whether these are driving or whether they are just reacting to, you know, political changes. I guess I tend to be a bit more sort of structuralist and historical materialist about my ideas of, of political change, but they are really playing a part in the one thing you can say about these conspiracy theories, as ridiculous as they often are, they are creative and they, they, they are good at cre just creating uh, new facades, even if they're just facades, like it, it's new stuff, it's new content. Content is the key word. Um, these are content creators. <laughs> Trump is a content creator. He describes his own politics in those terms, you know. Um, and and so what this culture does is it, it generates new content, which can be then reappropriated and reused exactly as the entire, you know, mode of production of, of social media, of YouTube, of Twitter, you know, this, this whole infrastructure exists to, to um, encourage exactly that kind of sharing and resharing. And, you know, th this is politics in that era, I would say. Thanks.
if there, if no one has any forthcoming questions, I'll ask something about a curiosity of mine um, about all this. And I think the what you just said there about the newness, it bounces off that quite well. Uh, it seems to me that there's a quite a spiral theme, a little underneath the surface, which of course you mentioned a, a bunch of times, which is the long history of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic uh, cliche, well, frameworks, cliches, particular conspiracies, the blood libels are almost a thousand years old um, and was used in multiple expulsions of all the Jews from countries, England for 400 years and in the, on the Iberian Peninsula and I think in many other places. Um, and you also mentioned that many of these critical theorists and this whole conspiracy about cultural Marxism and also Marx also just normal Marxism uh, as a kind of Jewish uh, a Jewish theory, Jewish communism, uh, and that being a reason to re for the, reje the strong rejection of cultural Marxism, uh, especially in very Protestant places. I think that's what often uh, those things often go together. How much is that how much is anti-Semitism on the surface of these types of discourses? Is it just kind of in the maelstrom, creating the themes by inheritance of ideas and inheritance of, you know, attitudes or, or, or suspicions about cabals and uh, and this and you know stuff to do with kids and or is there a, a strong driving force of anti-Semitism, but it's in some way silenced because of the association with Nazism and uh, you know everybody in Western Europe thinking of themselves as victors of the defeat of Nazism and therefore Democrats and so on and so on. Um, what's the relationship with anti-Semitism? Because it seems like the tropes are really the same as like first half of the 20th century, uh, various forms of fascism and, and anti expressed through anti-Semitism. Um, is it just under the surface by inheritance? Is it really a driving force but people are careful to use that to really, you know, adopt that explicit framework or that explicit vocabulary or yeah, what's the role if there is one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, I, I think it's probably necessary to distinguish between at least a couple of things. So there is, you know, there, there is anti-Semitism directed against Jews as an actually existing group or a set of groups. And then there is, if you like, kind of formal or structural anti-Semitism, which, um, you know, changes all the signifiers, but keeps the same form, keeps the same structure. So, you know, uh, a, a group who is inside and is sort of powerful and weak at the same time, um, and who, you know, needs to be uh, expelled in order to return purity to the, to the nation. Um, a group who is, you know, uh, yeah, who is uh, manipulating children, who doesn't quite belong to the Christian uh, world, who is very similar and yet completely alien. E even if you take away all the concrete signifiers of Jewishness, um, because of the history we have, um, there, that stuff is all still in the background, right? You can't erase that. And so, even, yeah, even when these, these these structures kind of keep reappearing with different content, um, yeah, I mean, this is still like it's still anti-Semitism just with new new content. Um, although, having said that, there is no it, that 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 uh, the, the kind of concrete uh, um, anti-Semitism is also always very much a part of it. Um, and, and again, to go back to the idea of the, I'll talk about the American far right, but I think this is also true more broadly um uh, the, the far right as a continuum uh there is no there is no one point at which you can say oh there is a break between you know, the mainstream acceptable uh, respectable uh, right and then the far right um these things are all entangled however there is there is there are still like um there are still lines at various points um which are being constantly challenged and one of those lines is like being a, a literal overt Nazi like that there's still you, you still can't really do that and be invited to the cool parties like you can't um, really you can't be part of the Republican Party certainly you can't be invited to the Republican Party events um, if you openly call for white supremacy and so 
what what the right discourse is. Um, it's a game of irony. It's a game of um, what well, they call it satire. I think I think it's not really satire. It's um, it's sarcasm. It's all based in sarcasm and or and you know edge lordism. You know this kind of being edgy, saying things to 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 trigger the libs, as they say. Um, certainly, if you get outside, um, uh, you know the the workings, the sort of Mitch McConnell um, type Republican Party politician who actually keeps the cogs of of legislation and of, and of blocking legislation. Yeah. There, 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 is, there is a core of, um, of party politics that is required to just keep the wheels moving. Um, but as soon as you get outside of that, as soon as you get to um, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is the best known um, elected you know, federal official um, who was a QAnon uh, advocate. She kind of went quieter on that once she was elected. Um, she attends um, kind of fringe uh, podcasts and fringe functions. She goes on the Alex Jones show. If you know Alex Jones, is sort of the um, he's a conspiracy theorist who has been around since the 1990s. He um, has you know he has a, a, a huge back catalogue. Um, he connects kind of 1990s anti anti globalization, anti new world order kind of theorizing with more contemporary um, thinking. Uh, yeah, as, as soon as you get outside of the, what is acceptable to the mainstream Republican Party, it's the, it's the zone of irony, it's the zone of, um, uh, of signaling, of saying things that can't be... A large part of it is about being able to say things, say things on mainstream platforms and not get kicked off. So there is a whole sort of... Um, uh, a whole sort of set of knowledge is being developed about how much can you say on YouTube without getting kicked off of YouTube? How, f how far can your organization go without getting booted from PayPal or Kickstarter or wherever it, wherever it is? And in terms of the, the sort of hard right, a large part of their problem in terms of, or, terms of organizing is actually um, they keep getting deplatformed from uh, payment organizations like they, they they can't make money if people won't take them you know, or people who want to donate to them you know there is no middle middle man to take that money um and so there are uh there are sort of right wing uh clones if you like of of like websites like kickstarter precisely because they have this problem um so yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a banal answer to say, well, it's all it's all connected, but it is, and it's it's these kind of multiple layers of um, dissimulation and kind of um, saying what you uh, yes, yeah, saying saying what you want to say in words that can't have you like be legally culpable for what you're saying. That that's the whole game, um, and the, the 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 plus side of that. The, the, the positive message, if I have one, <laughs> is that deplatforming works. And if you really mess with these people's revenue streams, like you can shut them down. And if they are shut down and they can't push their messages into the mainstream, that does have an effect. It's not like it's a immunization against what are ultimately, you know, to account for Trump, you have to account for, um, you know, the emergence of the populist right around the world, and you have to account for that in terms of structural changes, not anything unique to American political discourse, certainly. You have to think about the financial crisis and the crisis of neoliberalism as uh, as breaking with the idea of uh, neoliberalization as being this kind of trajectory towards wealth and happiness and, and, and order and everything else. You know, it's a breakdown of that narrative, that, that forward movement of history, which I think is probably the most important factor in terms of accounting for this resurgence around the world of this kind of politics. Um, but nevertheless, within that, there are there are actions which can be taken, which do have effects. And I think um, deplatforming, de not just getting people kicked off of Twitter, but also getting people kicked off of um, you know, kind of core infrastructural services. There, there is plenty of evidence that this stuff actually works. And I know that's, that's a somewhat hopeful uh, <laughs> dimension to this. Oh, another trend comes to mind this um, in the lots of protests against the coronavirus measures, 
people uh, would wear the, the like a, a yellow star mobilizing that framework you know not necessarily not in the same not in the same way and but it but it shows like you say it's in the background at least that those sets of symbols however they're mobilized in different settings and yeah perhaps that would be in then i think that would definitely fall under some kind of cons perhaps conspiratorial thinking but definitely some sort of criticality uh not the intellectual type that we're probably used to but a type of criticality and doing your own research and those types of things and then mobilizing those symbols become mobilized and yeah hmm. mobilizing an idea of repression yeah yeah because you know every, everyone likes it when nazis get punched in the face in movies right and that is still a thing which the vast majority of, of <laughs> publics can can rally around mm -hmm. Um, but then these uh, these groups have had decades upon decades of repackaging and repurposing and realigning to recon reconstitute essentially the same values in a different form. And I think what one very interesting dimension to this is, again, thinking about this in more international terms, is the place of the state of Israel in right wing politics in that from the perspective of a white supremacist, Israel isn't Jewish because it doesn't tick all the boxes of what the Jewish person is supposed to be in terms of the traditional anti-Semitism. Uh, Israel is not overly intellectual. It's not, um, you know, it's not inside. It's very explicitly outside. It's a, it's a nationalist project of its own kind. Um, it's based on strength, military strength. Um, it prioritizes that above all. Um, and it's an ultimately an ethno-nationalist project, which, and you know, um, you know, the white nationalists say this all the time, you know, we just want that for ourselves. We just want a country like Japan for ourselves. We're not against Japan. We don't think they're bad. We want uh, an ethnically homogenous state like Japan has. Um, of course, that erases every aspect of the entire history of everything um, in that, you know, <laughs> Uh, the United, well, all, all settler states, the United States included, are um, all, all happened almost yesterday in kind of world historic terms, and um, uh, and as a classic kind of phrase goes, in terms of where, where I am in the UK right now, um, people say um, uh, we are here because you were there. You know, um, that's why we have um, immigration from uh, former colonies to. Uh, European countries is because countries like the UK um, colonized the rest of the world and then invited people in when it was convenient to acquire cheap labor. So obviously there is no validity to um, these arguments, but it's a very convenient and superficially seemingly persuasive argument for them to make. Does anyone have any more questions? Then I suppose in that case we should wrap up. Thanks very much, Philip. Really interesting talk. Yeah, okay, really interesting my, my paper. pleasure. Thank you for your questions and for allowing me to talk at you for an hour and a half. <laughs> Thank you for talking at us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. See you next bye, Tuesday, bye. everybody. Bye. Take care.